and we're doing what he has called us to do, and I believe that's what we're doing. So I'm excited today to preach. I'm excited today for week two of Twisted Truths. I'm hoping uh, that uh, last week kind of made you think a little bit, made you kind of get into the, to the thinking mode of, okay, so what do I really look at? What does my truth really mean? What does it mean to have my truth? We talked about it last week. If you missed it, go back and see it. Uh, we talked about how this phrase is so prevalent in today's society but it holds no value because the phrase, my truth, is a non-negotiable opinion that only you, or based on your experiences and beliefs, uh, other people maybe, can't be argued really, okay? So we talked about that a good bit, but when you look at the true definition of absolute truth, you see that absolute truth is only absolute when it is objective rather than subjective. So I kind of gave the idea that, um, you know, the, the apples, there's a red apple, there's a green apple. We see it in front of us. That's objective truth because it's, you can't refute it. You can't say anything against it because it's true. It's right there. But when I say an apple tastes good, that's subjective because you may not like it. Do you understand where I'm going here? So go back, watch that if you missed it last week, because we looked at a lot of different things. So as we get more into the depths of this series, and as we continue to look at phrases that we often say, mostly without thinking, uh, maybe thinking about the value of what we say, uh, my prayer is that we can really allow the truth of the Word of God to permeate our hearts and souls so that believers we as believers can get a better grip on God's word. God's word is the most important word out there. That is the most important thing. It doesn't matter what we think. It's God's word. So there's a phrase that I hear more times than not, uh, more times than I can count, really. Uh, and I'm guessing everybody in this room, everybody watching this right now online, you have either said this once or said it many times, Okay. Uh, this phrase is interesting because it's easy to correspond Scripture closely with it. It's real easy. But here's the phrase. Everything happens for a reason. How many ever said that before? If you don't raise your hand, you are lying because we've all said it. <laughs> we've all said that. Everything happens for a reason, right? Now, at first glance, it could be argued that this isn't far off base from the Word of God. Okay, It's not far off. It often shows up in those moments of awkward silence when we try to comfort someone who has experienced something tragic in their life. That's usually what happens. We go, we go through something with somebody or we're, we're walking through something with somebody and we look at them and we say, everything happens for a reason. What that is is it's our defense mechanism because we don't know what else to say. And we're trying to fill some time, some awkward silence. We're trying to fill it with something that sounds biblical that we're not sure if it is or not. Okay, that, That's what we do. Because we, we get awkward. We get, oh, I don't know what to do. This phrase almost becomes defense for things that we don't understand. I don't know why this happens. Life has absolutes, right? Life has very few absolutes. Everything, life is just going crazy. A lot of times we can't put a finger on why things happen. Tragedy being one. I don't know why tragic events take place. I don't know. I don't know why bad people get, hurt, get away with things, and it seems like good people get hurt. I don't understand that. I don't know why God does some of the things he does or even allows certain things in life to happen. I don't know. The easy way out of this answer is that everything happens for a reason. That's an easy way out. Because we don't, we don't know how to deal with things. We don't have answers for stuff. Why do bad things happen to good people? Everything happens for a reason. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's real easy to get away from that because I don't want to answer the question because I might not have the answer for it. Or if I do have the answer for it and I try to speak the answer for it, you're going to get mad at me because that's not the answer you want to hear. So what I'm going to say is everything happens for a reason. I'm going to back off a little bit. Right? That's what we do. The fact of the matter is, why do bad things happen to good people? The answer is, because one day, a long time ago, two people in a garden took a bite of a piece of fruit and brought death and sin into the world, and that produced life, which was full of death, which was full of tragedy, which was full of bad things happening to good people, and we like to place the blame on God, but act actually the fault is ours. We brought sin into the world as a human race. That's why bad things happen to good people. But what we like to do is we say, oh, everything happens for a reason. It's okay. 
God's got everything in his hands. Everything happens for a reason. The phrase never appears in the Bible. The closest thing we have in Scripture is Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1, where it says, to everything there is a season. That's the closest thing we have to this whole idea of everything happens for a reason. But it's not exactly the same. Unless you consider an apple and an orange to be the same, in which you would be wrong, so it's not the same. It's absolute truth, right? An orange and an apple is different. It's objective. The bigger issue we deal with in this phrase is what it implies. You and I, as Americans, in an American church in this country, love to have a reason for things. Right? We, have, we love it. Christian bookstores and Amazon are filled with books trying to explain God logically. Trying to explain him. We got self-help books to help us cope with life. We, we want to we wanna cope, we want to deal with something, but instead of, uh, I love you, I love the church, but instead of trying to deal with things by going into our prayer closet where we're alone and we cry out to a holy and just God, what we do is we go on Amazon and we pick up every book we can possibly find for self-help. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the secret things belong to the Lord. So you're going to drive, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make some of you drive yourself crazy right now. Because there are things you will never know the answer to. Ever. The secret things belong to the Lord. There are things and events and happenings in life that we will never understand this side of heaven. And things that we are never meant to understand. Have you ever wondered why God has us wrestle with the puzzles of life? We wrestle with it. We look for an answer. Why God? Why? 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 And we don't know the answer and we never get it, so we get frustrated. Rather than saying, God, I trust you, like we sang today. God, I trust you. I don't understand. I don't know what's going on, but I'm going to trust you because I don't have a choice because the secret things belong to God. Right. I'm not just talking about things that the Bible says, but life in general. Why doesn't he make things more clear? If God is going to ask us to have faith in him, shouldn't he reveal himself more? These are, these are logistical, I mean, these are honest answers. These are challenges. Why do I have pain when I try to live a godly life? I don't understand that. Why is the world the way it is? Why is there so much garbage going on in the world right now? Why is there so much fighting, so much strife, so much crime, so much hatred, so much evil? Why is it going on right now? For a lot of people, the key question is whether or not there is a good and loving God at all. That's a question a lot of people have. Some believe not, but they still have unanswered questions. The human race is obsessed with asking questions. Obsessed. Because there's a need to have answers within us that we can't control. Think about this. And I love to watch this, and I, I do it too. We all do it. Come on, let's, let's just admit what I'm about to say, we all do it. Can we admit that together? <laughs> Two people are talking, having a conversation. I look over, and I'm drinking a Coke or something. I look over, and I see them having a conversation. I'm going to walk over here and I'm going to stand close to them so I can hear what they're saying. Why? Because knowledge is power and I need to know what they're saying. I need to know these answers. I need to know this. I need to know what they're talking about. It's, it's burning inside of me as a human. I need to know. I have to know everything. But when I, we get to the place where we can't know everything because all the secrets belong to God, we get frustrated with God. We get frustrated with life. We get frustrated with ourselves. As believers, we take it on faith that God has his reasons for all that he allows, even if we can't see them. But there are still a lot of mysteries. Even though scripture does reveal things to us, it also leaves a lot of unsaid things that makes us lust for the power of knowledge that we won't have as human beings on this earth because the secret things belong to the Lord. But we will drive ourselves crazy trying to find answers. I'm going to buy a book on that. I'm going to buy a book on that. What's going to happen in Revelation? There's a book on that somewhere. Yeah, it's called the Bible. 
Read Revelation, read Daniel, read Ezekiel, read Isaiah, read all these, put them together, start studying, dive, dive deep into Scripture, and you'll get some answers that you're looking for. So today I want to give us a few steps to help, help us navigate the mysteries we may never know. How do I deal with this as a human being? So this is our self-help book today, okay? How do we deal with the fact that we don't have all the power of knowledge that we really want? How do we deal with that as human beings? Number one, be honest in that we don't know everything. The first step is admitting, right? I don't know everything. I don't have all the answers. As a matter of fact, every person in this room could come to me and ask me the same question. And sometimes I might not have the answer to stuff. Just because I'm the pastor doesn't mean I'm a know-all genie. I may not have answers, but I'm going to be honest with you. And I'm going to tell you, I don't have the answers, but I'm going to do all I can to find it. And then I'm going to challenge you to find it too. Talk to Jesus. It's important. This is important to understand. Because the last thing we need is another Christian acting like they know everything. As if all the mysteries and purposes of God should just be clear to everyone. This makes us look bad. To people who may genuinely wrestle with questions. We're, listen, there's a generation coming up right now that wrestle with questions. They want to know answers. They got questions. They got them. What do we do about that? How do we understand this? They're genuinely wrestling. The last thing they need is Christians acting like they have all the answers and lead them into a bad direction. We as Christians like to say the Bible says it. I believe it, and that settles it. Anybody ever said that before? The Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it. That's it. No more discussion. You don't have any more discussion because you don't know the answer. So you like to cop out that. Like God said. God said everybody's going to be quiet. They're not going to talk to you anymore because God said it, so why shouldn't I believe it? This is fine if you're just affirming your belief and trust in the Bible in general, but when it comes to, oh, I don't know the entire book of Revelation, we have to admit that there is room for uncertainty regarding what exactly the Bible is saying. There's room. There are things that we can know and some good answers that we can give, but we should also know our limitations. We should know our limitations. Number two, the second thing, help us navigate this whole thing. The second step is to examine what Scripture has to say about the things God keeps hidden. What does scripture say about it? Before we get caught up in the mysteries of God or looking to see what he isn't telling us because we think God is this secretive God and he's keeping things from us, we should realize that the whole Bible, and this is for anybody who's never read the Bible because this is going to be a breakthrough for you, I'm praying. The whole Bible is a record of God revealing himself to people. So if you've got answers, pick up scripture. Pick up the word of God. If you've got questions and you say, I don't understand this, pick up scripture. This whole book is a book of God revealing his character. It's revealing who he is. A great example is Acts chapter 17. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there or you can look on the screen. Acts 17, verses, beginning with verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands, as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations, that they may or should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. Verse 27, God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he is not far from any one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. He gives us enough to develop our faith in him because God's desire is for us to respond to him in faith without him manipulating a relationship, which doesn't happen and never will happen. He is so close right now, and we act like he's so far away because we don't understand everything. I found that the closer I get, the more he reveals himself to me. I'm going to tell you a little personal story. So when I first got saved, when I first came to Jesus, February 21st, 1995, when I first laid my life down and said, Jesus, I want you as my Lord and Savior, 
he began to reveal things to me. But this is what he began to reveal to me. He stuck with only a couple of things. I love you. I died for you. I love you. I died for you. I love you. I died for you. See, when we're baby Christians, when we just start out, the revealing of God is not all the questions we have. It's all the character that he is. Because you have to get to know him. It's like I tell people, when you first get saved, you can't say, I love Jesus, because you haven't fallen in love with him yet. You accept him, and you're going to serve him as your Lord and Savior, but it's over time that you begin that just falling in love with the Savior, because you get to know who he is. He reveals himself to you. So in the early stages, he begins to reveal his love. He begins to reveal his character and who he is and what he did for me. And as I get older... The more I walked with Jesus, the revelations he gave me became more pointed and personal to me. Those revelations weren't written in the Bible for all to see. However, they did complement the word of God. Don't you ever let somebody speak a word from God over you that contradicts the Bible. Don't even listen to it. See, this means that God will never reveal himself to you or speak to you anything that contradicts what his word already says. He's not going to do it. God reveals truth to those who seek and obey. Draw closer to me and I'll draw, draw closer to you. You know the, the scripture. He hides truth from those who resist and rebel. Here's an example. When Jesus spoke and the Jewish leaders began uh, actively rejecting and resisting what he was saying. He shifted gears and he began to speak in parables. So that only those who were really seeking truth would find it. And understand what Jesus was teaching. Okay, you think, well that was mean. Don't even want people to, no. When you're seeking him, you'll understand what he's, what he's talking about. You'll understand what he's saying to you. But when you start rebelling and rejecting what he's saying. Like, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Well, if you don't believe that, how is he going to reveal that to you? There's a belief, there's a faith that comes in. Matthew chapter 13, verse 9. Jesus says, whoever has ears, let him hear. Okay? In other words, only those who were actively listening for and seeking the truth would find it. For every question, we would love for God to answer in place of us just simply saying everything happens for a reason, okay, instead of saying that, then we have to ask ourselves if we are obeying what he has already revealed in the word of God. Are we obeying that? Are we walking in obedience? Number three, for the, the, this whole navigational period, number three is knowledge isn't the goal, obedience is. Knowledge isn't our goal. We think it is. We want it to be. I want to understand things. I want to know things. I want to, I want to, I want to be revealed all these secrets of God. But for, first, the secrets of God belong to him. Two, he's not wanting you to be all knowledgeable, all powerful in your knowledge. He wants you to have a, a relationship with him that causes you to be obedient. So knowledge isn't the goal. Obedience is. Octavio, Octavio uh, Esquesto, I, I don't know how to say his name. Forgive me, I'm from Alabama, we don't talk well. A professor, a professor at Talbot School of Theology, he once said this, God's goal is not to satisfy our curiosity, but to change us according to his will. Thus, obedience is the purpose of God's revelation to us. Obedience is his purpose to reveal himself, to reveal what his secrets are. That's his purpose, for us to walk in obedience. I want to show you the other part of that scripture in Deuteronomy 29, 29. Secret things belong to the Lord. We've said that. But those that are revealed belong to us and our descendants forever so that we might obey all the words of this law. Obedience is more important than knowledge. There are things that we will never know this side of heaven. And it's okay if you're dealing with somebody with a tragedy, if you're dealing with somebody going through something, it's okay to say, I don't know. It's okay to say, I don't understand why this is happening. But I want to pray with you. It's okay. It's okay to love somebody through something without 
making them this, I have this idea that all things happen for a reason. Revelation comes in obedience. God tells us in Psalm 84, 11 that he withholds no good thing from those who have integrity. It's okay for us not to have all the answers because our relationship is with the answer. Do you hear that? It's okay for us not to have all the answers because we are close to the answer. He is the answer of all things, even if we don't know all the answers. At the end of the day, we have to trust that God has our best interest at heart. I've learned to thank God for the mysteries because not knowing everything is an invitation for me to draw closer to him in trust and faith and understanding that we are not alone on this journey, but rather the master, the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords, and the lion of the tribe of Judah is on our side. That's what it makes me do. It makes me draw closer to him. At the end of the day, God is all-knowing, and we are not. But keep seeking him. Keep walking in obedience. And keep allowing him to download new revelations to you. Believe the church today, the church as a whole, has put this wedge between ourselves and God by the way we act sometimes. By the the distaste that the world has for the church. I said it last week. The world doesn't hate the church, but we have made it in, we have made it a lot of ways where they don't have a choice but to. We worry about things too much that we shouldn't worry about. We worry about what the, the tangible little building stuff or whatever. We worry about that stuff too much, and it's about saving people. It's about bringing people to Jesus. That's what the church is about. It's a mentality change that I believe will bring revelation. When we change the way we think, when we start to understand the heart of God, we'll start seeing the revelation of God come back to the church again, to us as individuals again. Remember, it starts with me. It starts with me. If we want to see that, it starts here. It starts with me every time. So my challenge for you today is to understand that you can never have full knowledge of God. You will never have full knowledge of everything that he has. The mysteries belong to him. But I promise you this, the closer you get to him, the more he reveals himself to you and makes you trust him even more, even in the things that you don't understand. So Jesus, today I ask you, God, to help us. Help us. Help us to realize Lord, that the secrets belong to you. And it's okay for us not to have all the answers. Because we know you do. Help us to step in faith and walk in faith and lay our lives down before you, knowing that you are in control, that you're going to take care of things. These things in life that we don't understand, Lord, I just pray that we'll be okay with that sometimes we'll be okay with that because you are ultimately in control you are the answer if there's anyone here today with every so we're in this, this place of prayer if, you, if you're in here this morning and you don't know Jesus it's not your savior you haven't made that commitment yet you haven't given your heart over to him I'll tell you a really easy way to do it Right in front of you, there's a little card stuck on the, stuck on the seat. A little QR code. I know it's modern for some of you, but take your camera out, click it, and make that decision today. It's simple as this. If you're here and you say, I don't, I don't know Jesus, I don't know how to know Jesus. It's simple as this. In your heart, you just say, I'm in need of a Savior. I'm in need of a Lord. And today, Jesus, I want to make you that to me. I want to make you that in my life. Forgive me of my sin. We've all sinned. Listen, everybody in this room, nobody's sinless. We've all messed up. So you just say, forgive me of those things. Help me grow. Surround me with your love. Show yourself to me. I promise you, it happened to me. 
As soon as I gave my heart to Jesus, he began to show me how much he loved me in various ways. So if that's you today, please let us know about it. We want to help you. We want to walk with you. But if we don't know who you are, it's hard for us to do that. So let us know so we can walk with you. Jesus, I ask you, Lord, for every person here that may, may make that decision today to make Jesus Lord of their life, I just pray, Father, like you did for me, God, show them your love. Let them see the cross when they close their eyes so that they were reminded of what you did for them because you love them so much. And God, for all of us who struggle, we struggle with needing knowledge. We struggle with needing that power. Help us to release that to you today and just realize that we don't have all the answers. But God, you do. So we're placing our trust and our faith completely and entirely in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can you give it up for those people that just gave their lives to Jesus?